Okay, we've had lunch. Now it's time for Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel on ThinkTech. This is Frank Rogers next to me. He does tiny houses. Hi, Frank. Welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Nice to be here. You know, this is very important. You and I spoke. We met at a party. I like to meet people. I found out you had been on ThinkTech before yep. with Howard Wig and Code Green. Um, and then I, th I started thinking how valuable it was uh, to have this discussion in another context. Because your products, uh, you know, are very energy efficient. That's why Howard wanted to talk to you. I want to talk to you for a different reason. You know, there's an article in the New York Times this morning um, about uh, homeless in California. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a growing number of people. They're everywhere. Uh, they're in all the neighborhoods or a lot of neighborhoods. Uh, and there's pushback by, by, you know, people with homes who, you know, have addresses. Um, and it's getting to be an aggravated situation, according to the article. Um, and then, indeed, you know, I, I talked to an HPD officer the other day, and uh, I asked him, you know, gee, I've been reading, reading little articles from around the country, and it seems like there's more violence by homeless, including here in Honolulu, uh, where homeless people attack people. Not necessarily to rob them, but just to sort of act out. Maybe it's mental illness, maybe it's just acting out, maybe it's frustration, who knows what. Um, but I've heard stories, and he said, yes, that's true. That's true. We have, you know, so we have a bit of a contention. Um, people um, are not, not as tolerant, perhaps, in California and here uh, of the homeless, and, uh, and the homeless are not as tolerant of uh, people here either, and they become a big problem. And there are more of them than you can shake a stick at. You know, the estimate, the last estimate I heard was 15,000. I bet you five. It's much more than that, and it continues to increase. Okay, so, um, you know, what is the state doing for the homeless? Well, not much. And private charities are, there's hundreds of private charities, all feeding them in all different places, and there's no control over where they are, you know? Uh, and so the city builds uh, potted plants and the like to keep them out of this or out of that, but that's really not a solution. It's, uh, you know, it's anecdotal at best. Okay, there's no real program, sorry to say, to deal with them, I'm sorry to say that. Um, big problem. <clears throat> then we have affordable housing, and the state has done precious little about affordable housing and all these bills 10 years ago, you know, requiring developers to set aside X number of percentage of uh, apartments, say in a condo for affordable housing. What difference does that make in a condo where the penthouse goes for $100 million? What difference does it make in a condo uh, in Kaka'ako, you know, the, 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 the de rigueur, it's two, three million dollars all along the water, two, three, four million dollars. Uh, and look, you can look down on the blue tents of the homeless down there and there's really very little affordable housing going on, and there's not a lot of plans for it. Uh, furthermore, it just strikes me that the Department of Planning and Permitting, we, we all know very well, um, you know, they understand the problem, but in fact, they don't do anything about the problem. They give building permits to these huge, multi-million dollar units, while regular people, middle class people, cannot afford um, housing. So we have a big housing problem here. So when we, you and I talked at the party we met and we had a good conversation and you told me and showed me your stuff on uh, Tiny House, I thought maybe this is, a, uh, maybe this is a, a solution. Maybe this is something that we can insinuate into the process, into the concept, into the vision of dealing with both of these things that I described. Um, and, um, you know, uh, I called the show uh, Tiny Houses to the Rescue. <laughs> maybe, Frank, uh, you know, you can help us rescue two very <coughs> difficult problems in the state. So let's ask you about the tiny houses. You're, you're a roofing contractor, but you went into tiny houses. Why? <clears throat> I was going to bid on the Sand Island project. That was the one that they built over on Sand Island, and they used um, shipping containers. And I was one of uh, three that was a kind of in a partnership that was going to uh, bid for that. And um, also at the same time, they were going to bid on one in Makaha. I think it became the Halona project, I believe. Might be wrong on that, but it was in, in Waianae area. And what I noticed was that um, the way we were going to bid that, I was going to be part of the shipping container guys that did that. And also with kind of an alternative for the Chinese modular houses where you buy the panels from China and you put them all together. And, but the bottom line, just like you say, it, became, it was so expensive. To me, it didn't make sense. It was so expensive. So cumbersome, so many things that are not optimal about living in a, in a shipping container. You know, it's hot, it's oppressive. And by the time you did all the modifications that they wanted to, it became, actually, if you look at it, pretty expensive. Now, what does it cost to have a sh make a shipping container, buy a shipping container, make it into a house? 
Well, my guess is 20 grand anyway. Yeah, 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 and and more because you have all sorts of things that you have to do. I mean, rightfully so, like like access ramps, and they they separated the the, the uh, shipping container, a 40 footer, into I think five different compartments. So it's almost like a jail cell with a window. And of course, it's metal and it's hot. And I don't mean to put down shipping containers because I think that overall they're fairly happy, as I understand, with the Sand Island thing. But it. Um, because of the wraparound services and, and, and a lot of things. But I guess basically what I found out was there were a lot of, th it wasn't optimum by any means. And the Chinese modular thing was expensive and the tariff situation. And if you're missing a piece, it takes you eight weeks to get it. Maybe you get it, maybe you won't. So <clears throat> I decided not to bid on those two projects. And I decided then that, but it got me thinking about if I could build it any way I wanted to. Um, and I remember Elon Musk, talking about, not that I'm comparing myself to Elon Musk, but the concept that he had was when he did the electric car, they said, well, you can't do that because this is gonna happen. You're gonna run over grandkids and state rules and federal rules, every state has this, all the reasons that you can't build electric cars or self-driving cars, let's say that too. This is why you can't do it. But he just said his planning process was, forget all that, I'm gonna design it the way I want it to, the way I think it's gonna work, and then we'll see what we can do from there. Well, see? but that, that, that you're suggesting DPP is gonna approve that. DPP is not easy. I'm working, the DPP is very concerned, and the DPP solicited me, um, thankfully, and, and had me speak in just for 10 or 15 minutes in front of their monthly meeting where they have all the building inspectors come from all the islands at Kalani, um, uh, Kalani Moku uh, building over there. And I was really appreciative, uh, appreciative of Howard Wig to allow me to do that. And so I got to take questions from them and show them this is what I'm doing. Um, the reason I built it originally, if you see the ones, if you show some exteriors on there, Eric, the reason that we built it um, 10 by 12 is it's 120 square feet. So with 120 square feet... Let's go through your pictures. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's, we're going to get a slideshow here. Here's an exterior of, um, of a house that's being built. Um, so you build them on site. Th yeah, this was built on site. Yeah. Two, as I recall, you have two workmen build the house. That's what it takes. Yeah, to, well, sometimes we'll have three. And they can do it in but how two long? Can do it, two can do it in two days if it's all pre-manufactured off-site and ready to go. Okay. Right, so two can erect it in two days. And by that, it means the whole structure. Here, this is what we call post and panel construction. And what we do is we use laminated uh, boards. They're three-quarter inch plywood. They have a termosite in all the glue levels so the termites can't get them. But they have a formica sheathing on each side of it. And then those panels are joined with aluminum connectors. And then we put other aluminum, cla aluminum cladding around that. And then we coat it with waterproof and re heat reflective coatings on the outside. That's part of the secret sauce. Okay. Because you have to meet those the energy. Are, those are aluminum struts I see yep. off of the roof. Yeah, that's the aircraft grade aluminum. It's called T6 Okay, that's a tiny house. What's the dimensions on that? 10 by 12. Okay, and the other thing is, are you, are you leasing the land, buying the land, causing the, the ultimate user, buyer of the house to lease or buy the land? How do you get control of the land? Always a big question. Here right, exactly. Well, the ones we've been building now, we've been checking out our processes, and they have been uh, mostly um, single-family owners that want something in the back of their, their, their lot and, um, and want it for, you know, storage and it's totally legal as storage. Um, we have filed for permits and we've had good um, feedback. And we're at the final stages of getting our office so that it's legal so you can actually make it as a regular building. You gotta thing. live there, yeah. And, and then it doesn't have to be 10 by 12. I call that my, my Trojan pony. But it's you have to, have to have zoning that will allow that, huh? Uh, yeah, well, you have to have an ADU or, 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 um, okay. or a farm or whatever so you, you want to have. Is it a variance kind of situation or does it fit within some you know, pre-organized, pre-written uh, permission? Um, we don't have pre-approval yet because we first are just getting the approval for the first one. Um, but my, I've got stamped engineers and it, when we look at it, we meet all, I was afraid that I wouldn't meet the requirements. I thought, gee, do they still allow single family, um, uh, a single, excuse me, single wall construction? When I came to Kailua in 1960, we lived in a single, Wall house, you know, There's red a lot of single wall houses. A lot of single wall houses, yeah. right? We might be worried about flammability. Well, the formica sheathing is actually better than having the wood sheeting. Mm -hmm. And actually, the key was if it's insulation and I have to do double wall, I don't want to do double wall. People, I, I hate double wall. People hate double wall in wet areas because 
you have bugs and moisture and everything gets back there. It's really hard to construct. And you don't need it. You don't need it because yeah. in, a, in a warm climate, as long as you can reflect the heat with the heat reflective coatings and you can waterproof it, yeah. you don't need a roof. I don't have a roof. I don't have, I don't have siding. I don't have you know, Tyvek So you save a lot of money on materials. A lot of money, a lot of weight. Mm. And you don't need it. Okay, so going back to my land question. So what's the model here? I'm trying to sort of fit this shoe sure. into the notion of helping homeless and helping people who can't afford that, um, a yeah, regular house. Yeah. That's, that's my main goal. I'm doing it for private houses now to shake out my processes and my efficiencies. How do you get the land? Well, right now, I think I can reveal, but I'm working with some people on the city council that uh, um, are interested in seeing if, if it's going to fit. I, think, I, I don't think there's any reason I can't. They didn't say I could, but I'm... I'm working with um, Kimberly Pine on um, Pu'u Honua Owainai. And as you know, that's got all sorts of tarps and slanties and things, but that's in what they call an Ohana zone. An Ohana zone can have um, uh, variances on, on um, things like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm wanting to build it in a way that I don't even need the variances, that I can fully meet building code irregardless. It's not a big deal. We're there anyway, the way we see it. Well, what I'm thinking, and maybe, maybe this is already in discussion, is uh, you, get, you get land. Somebody gives you land. And by the way, most of the, the land in the state of Hawaii is owned by the state of Hawaii. Mm. And, and the state of Hawaii is notoriously unwilling to share that land. Mm -hmm. It doesn't keep, keep it title. I'm not sure why. Maybe it's for a day when uh, sovereignty is reversed and we're back to 1892. Right. I don't know why. But uh, bottom line is there's a lot of land available that the state doesn't let, let anybody use it. Um, so let's assume you have a 500-acre parcel. Let's okay. assume you want to build a community. I love it. Streets, right? Uh, lighting, uh, plumbing, the whole nine yards, literally. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you want to put tiny houses down because you could put more in there. And you build common areas and all this. It's a, it's a development. It's not a Chicago project, right? right. Which, which we know doesn't work. Right. It's more of a community of small houses. Right. Uh, so let's, let's use that as a model, okay? That's, that's our, why, that's that's why our call, case study. That's why I call it an intentional community, and it's my dream. I, I want to do that. <laughs> okay. So we find a way to get you 500 acres, okay? What happens then? Okay, so this is the fun part. This is the part that is really different, is that it's very simple to put this up. You don't have to be a contractor. You do need one person who's a good handyman, good with tools. You don't even need many tools, you know, impact wrench and a saw and a couple of things. You don't need a lot of skill, but you need a couple of able-bodied people. So let me just say, besides the homeless, the other market that's right adjacent to that is emergency housing, i.e. Pahoa, Kauai, Wildfires. What's emergency? Oh, okay. Emerg emergency housing means you just, you just had a, you, you had a hurricane. Have you. Of course, we never have hurricanes in Hawaii, never have floods in Hawaii, never have volcanoes or wildfires in Hawaii or Northern California. But if you did, well, all of a sudden what you do is you have a whole village that's homeless, basically. They're involuntary homeless, I guess you could call them. And for my purposes, that's good because if we can store, we can store our house in a stack of of our panels is only like 19 inches high. I think you might have a, a warehouse. If you look at the warehouse slide, I think you might do that. So well, let's go through the slides. Yeah, imagine here. So this is all the panels when they're broken down. This is the roof, the walls, and the, and the, uh, and the flooring all broken down here. That's about 19 inches high. That's one 10 by 12 unit that can actually sleep um, uh, easily a family of four, say a husband and a wife and two kids. Um, so you have this uh, in storage, essentially. So let's say the Red Cross or someone has, let's say, 20 of these in a warehouse. Yeah. So they're, you know, a foot and a half tall, and so you have 20 of them, so, you know, 30 feet but or if so. If it's emergency, why don't I just build a big tent, one of those sprung structures? They got those all over, and they, yeah. and they go What's right a, up. What know? happens when the hurricane comes next week, <laughs> right? So we, we contend that we think we will be one of the last structures standing after a, after a major because hurricane. Well, because if you look at the building again, our, if you look at our framework, the panel and post one, um, now see all the, see, how, see the way they're all bolted together? Those are bolted together with stainless steel bolts and, and really thick uh, non-corrosive. So it's not temporary. No, it's permanent. It's not, it's it, permanent. it will last longer than. So why, why, why have uh, all the building components on the side? Why don't you just build my 500 acres? Build it. 
Build it now. You know, build it and they will come. They will come. Well, for, we were talking about Pahoa. We were talking about, uh, or, or a hurricane. We're talking about emergency deployment. And then I'll get, I'll get to that because that's, it's, it's adjacent, but I'm saying they're similar. But, but the advantage of this. Does adjacent really matter? I mean, they don't have housing. They're sleeping on the pavement. Um, why can't we just, you know, buy a plane ticket and move them to we, the location with a house? Yeah, well, 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 this is what, okay, if, do you want to move into homeless rather than emergency housing? I don't know. Uh, emergency housing for people who lost okay, their so, homes, yeah. eruptions, what have you. Okay, so what could happen is you get, let's say you want to have 20 houses just as your, your base to start everything off. So you keep those in a warehouse, Red Cross, Hawaii National Guard, whatever. Boom, the hurricane hits. The minute the hurricane goes, you put these either on a Huey or you put them on uh, Young Brothers, you take them out to wherever the, the hurricane was. Within a couple days, you're, you're forking these off of, off of there. You take them up there. What do you have after uh, an emergency? You have a lot of homeless people and uh, involuntarily homeless people. And you also have a lot of concrete slabs, let's say, because the hurricane has just decimated the house. That's also good for our system because one of the most the, the expensive parts is having for us to, to pour our own slab or put it up on concrete blocks. So right away, if they say, well, listen, here's an old mill or an old warehouse, we're not going to rebuild there. And, and it's, it's like an old, you know, like an old 20,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet. Well, we only need 120 per house and a little space in between everything. We could build a, a village there with all the unemployed, able-bodied people don't have to be contractors. We'll, we send over one or two of our guys, or if they have good contractors there, we train them. What about uh, the union? Well, uh, um, that's good. You know, I'm happy to have the union carpenters participate because I, we don't care if they're paid 40 or 50 years. I like having non-union work, workers well, work. There. Well, but here's the thing. Um, uh, this, is for, this is an emergency. This is people are, if they want to come and, and do it, that's fine. I, you know, the, I think a couple things. The, the carpenters, they're, they're, they have people, they have family, and they, have, they see the homeless situation too. They're affected by that too, okay? We're not building these as suburbs here. We're building this as emergency housing. It can be permanent or temporary. You can take it down again. We can take it down and, and uh, collapse it in two days. But what I'm saying is, if, you, if, the, if we have this whole people, they're unemployed, they're shivering in the rain, we get, these, we get the things over there in two or three days. And the first thing we build is we build you know, um, emergency housing for um, the medical people that come, the support systems, and for the most vulnerable, the kids. So the able-bodied people come. We come in with one or two of our guys. It's like a big Ikea set. We say, take this, bolt this together, put the panels here. Yeah, do that. No, don't do that. Do that over here. Boom, boom, boom. We get, we get all of that together, and they're all building houses simultaneously on, say, the slab or parking lot or whatever they give us, whether it's going to be temporary or permanent. So you could build a village of those 20 houses in a week, you know, maybe less. And all of a sudden, you've got 20 houses now that now have shelter. Um, I'm obviously, in two weeks, you could do 40 or 60 or whatever number you want to have that's in storage, that's pre-manufactured, mm -hmm. it's pre-cut, it's mm -hmm. a kit, has all the bolts, it has everything you need, and people could figure out how to put it together themselves, but with just one or two people that know how to do it, they can do is it. Is Kimberly Pine helping you with this? She is. I'm, um, I'm meeting with her. Um, she's going to take a look at it, and, she, and then we're going to go take a look at um, uh, Pu'u Honui. Uh, Pu'u Onua Owai and I over there, hopefully, and if they like if they like our concept, if it fits into what they want to do, we can do it. But let me let's then let's shift to over there. What I would like to do, and again, I I uh, uh, they haven't signed off on this, but this is what I would propose. I think it's ex extremely exciting. I'm a roofing contractor. I've been doing it for 40 years. I will tell you that my company, Leak Master Roofing, we've executed tens of thousands of contracts successfully without any major complaints. We also work with a couple of our crews. We always have um, that we work with Laumaka, the work furlough pros program, basically prisoners on, on furlough that are trying to get back into the working environment. This will train them. Yeah, well, we have a lot of experience doing that. We work with, with um, Job Corps also. In the 40 years I've been doing this, we work, uh, we work with getting people back that aren't necessarily, you know, kind of a little bit on the margins to get them back into work. Roofing is a good business for that because it's tough, hard work, and it fits them good. And I will tell you our very best crew that we have right now, and we have had, by the way, no personal problems. We haven't had any thefts, fist fights, anything like that that we attribute in these 40 years to working with that population. Well, yeah, we've had people that wash out, some that don't do well. What I'd like to do is get the able-bodied homeless. Again, the able-bodied 
homeless. You know, I mean, the person who's really the the hardcore well, that's gets, a, schizophrenic that stirs the heart to do that, and and, and then motivated because it's their home, and, and then, you help them help them learn, and, and before you know it, the thing springs up like a mushroom. Then they don't need me. Then they can well, build it themselves. Maybe that's they're going to need you. <laughs> well, they're gonna, um, uh, hopefully if we do our job right, um, they buy the kit from me because we own the rights to the kit. They is who. Uh, the the um, the state, the city, whoever wants to build these things, someone's mm -hmm. going to have to pay for them. Right? Well, let me let me shift gears to uh, this five hundred acre parcel mm -hmm. again. So I say, you know, there are even conservatively fifteen thousand homeless in the state, sure. twenty maybe twenty five, sure. who knows? Uh, and I say we got to do something, and I'm the governor, making myself governor right now. Okay, I say we're going to do something. We are actually going to do it, and I'm going to find five hundred acres of state land. Um, and I am going to, I'm going to give it to an entity which is going to build a village, the village you talked about, mm -hmm. with these homes that go up fast and that mm -hmm. are perfectly serviceable and efficient. And you make paths and you make common mm -hmm. areas, a park, who knows what. Mm -hmm. uh, even parking, because even homeless people have cars sometimes. Um, and I make the community virtually overnight. Okay. Uh, now I have this community. How do you prevent this community from devolving into a Chicago project? How do you make this community a civilized area where people are taking care of their tiny homes? Sure. Well, what we found out with the Sand Island project was, even though I didn't think the structures were optimum, um, and they first had a hard time selling it to the homeless because they didn't want to give up their addictions, their pets, their freedom, what have you. They had to make it, believe it or not, this was news to me, attractive to the homeless. You think, oh my gosh, free shelter, let's go do it. There's rules and regulations, and I think they've found the same thing, and I'm, I, I haven't been out there yet to talk to them, but I will. But as I understand, it's the same thing at uh, Pu'u Honua, where you just can't do whatever you want to, whenever you want to, and just party all the time. They won't allow that. And I, I believe with the Ohana... What's the sanction? If you, don't, if you don't follow the rules, what happens to you? You get fined? What happens? <laughs> they've got some guys there who I guess will you know, we'll figure it out. But, but um, It's very important. Well, but... Because you can't, you can't as uh, I understand do violence. It. You, right. you can't, what, you can't do you, anything you Noise after a certain time and things yeah. like that, yeah. So again, I'm not an extra expert on them, uh, but I hope to be, because I hope to be building the village out there. But, and I will be meeting with them hopefully in the next week or two. But, um, but the thing is that they do have, they're allowed, I think, under the Ohana law, uh, to, um, to have certain rules and regulations and variances on how they do things, as long as the state kind of signs off on it and makes sure it's not the Wild West. And as I understand, I think they're pointing to that as kind of a success, and that's why they've gotten money now to expand and to well, do things. things uh, all I'm saying is they, they really need to have a system where people are, are encouraged, sure. incentivized, or punished if they don't follow the rules. Because uh, you don't know. You, you're getting a, a population, some of whom have been homeless for decades already, and you've got to ensure that for the safety of the neighbor mm -hmm. that they're going to behave themselves. The other thing is getting them into the village. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you about that. You know, because what happens is these three, four hundred charities are out there, mm -hmm. um, you know, giving them food in situ, wherever they are. Um, and uh, they, you know, they come around and they line up and get a soup kitchen or some source of food. And the, the churches, the, the, you know, the organizations that, that feel morally sure. bound to help them go out and help them. Nobody would stop them and all that. The problem sure. is that if they're getting food at, at, in situ, yeah. um, they're not encouraged to go to the village. So I know this is not a question of, uh, of contracting or, or designing or of tiny houses, but uh, in this 500-acre model that yes, we're playing yes. with here, how do you get these people to go to the village and try it out? That, that's a great question. And what I found out, like just as a small aside to that, is, which I didn't know, is one of the biggest things that they, the homeless people want and actually need, it's the uh, necessity, Chargers to get their telephone charged. You know, <laughs> they, all the coffee. They don't you want, heard it here on Think Tech. <laughs> right. No, they, 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 they get their notification. This is their only form of communication and email and every other thing. And, you know, phones aren't that expensive anymore, but you have to have them charged. And so I was talking to people that dealt with this, and they said, make sure you have a lot of phone chargers. I go, done. Food is another thing. But, you know, here's the thing, Jay. I agree totally with this, and I think a lot of people do. Like a lot of people, I have both, you know, Parts of me that are conservative and parts of me that are, you know, liberal. And being a, you know, small uh, roofing contractor, that's more the, I hate to say, that's more the, you know, you know, the demographic that goes a little more conservative, right? And so there's a part of me that says, I don't want a free ride for people who are able-bodied able either. So I, this is something that is, would be 
is what I want to experiment with because I believe, we, but we work with these kind of people and there's, it's very Skinnerian. It's, you know, punishment, reward, compliments, et cetera, to get people to go. And so what, um, what I would say is this comes to the heart of things. And, and I read that article in the New York Times, too, about Oakland and stuff. And I think people are under the mistaken opinion that the ACLU says you can't arrest people for being homeless unless you can put them into a shelter. And to me... Is that the law in California or anywhere? Well, in that New York Times thing, they were talking about, um, I think the politicians come out, were talking about, we're, we're talking about, about, about saying you, can't, you just can't sleep here. You can't de it's illegal to defecate in the street. Yeah. It's illegal to do a lot of these things yeah. here. The problem is, is when you arrest them, they don't want to fill up the jails, et cetera. So you have to have a place. So you have to have a place. So if you have that place, so I would say that there's some of these places you might just like, and like you say, a lot of them are mentally ill, and sometimes you have to involuntarily put mentally ill people in a mentally ill facility. But again, that's clogged in Kaneohe too. But let's say you take them to a nice organic farm, if we may, and what they're entitled to is a place to sleep, and, and it maybe has a little bit, you know, light. It's out there in the country, out in, you know, Cunia, Waipahu, wherever. I know nobody wants it in their backyard, and I don't blame them. But wherever it is, I say get it away from everyone else and have a shuttle service that can take you to get your services. And also doctors can come in and check them on a regular basis. A village. It's, it's a village that, that has wraparound support and services yeah. because we know that that works. It has rules. But, but that guy that doesn't want to work, the able-bodied guy, that everybody gets, gets a bed. Well, yeah. let's put it this way. Can you show some exterior shots, Eric, of our place there? We only have a couple of minutes left here. Yeah. So, okay, well, that's, that's not a bad one. But show one where, where it's finished. Um, keep going. Keep going. What you can do, this talks about how you can decompose the house in just uh, two days and move it in case there is a volcano mm -hmm. where we like to build. Keep on going, though, uh, just a little bit more. There are no more handy. Oh, there are no more handy. Okay. Well, basically, in, in a house, and that's kind of an upscale one, we we're trying to show what you could do, but you can divide that into two, um, two, two different uh, right down the middle, and let's say you're unwilling to work, you're just a gnarly guy, but you're creating a problem down here. Okay. You broke the law. You're convicted of, you know, defecation and assault, like you were talking about, things like that. We're going to put you in here, in, in a half a house here that's divided, and you're going to be safe. But if after a while, once we get you off the wrong chemicals that are coming into you, and maybe some of these people need the right chemicals coming back in, and maybe they also need sunshine and, and food, and, and maybe they need... Um, caseworkers. Yeah, caseworkers. Maybe they need meds. You know, maybe they need some kind of meds to calm them down to get their situation. Mm. But that's what they found, I think. I think they found this in Sand Island and a lot of places, that once they get you stabilized and you're not sleeping underneath the freeway, a lot of these guys, able-bodied guys, can go back to work and work at a roofing company so or it's work a, as a short It's a continuum. Partner. The village is not a right. unilateral village with everything the same. The village has steps in it. I think so. This, stages. this is my idea. So, so let's say you, you get stabilized. You go, well, you know, I don't like sleeping and I don't want a half a house and I, the guy snores next door to me. I want my own place. Okay, here's what you do. Help around the community. Help clean up the kitchen. Help with and the what papaya. for that? Um, I think they should get a wage. I think they should get a decent wage. And, and I, by the way, I worked um, uh, at agriculture. I was immigrant labor all around the world, including in Israel, and we were paid by the bushel. If I got a bushel of grapefruit in, in Haifa, I didn't have to work for the rest of the day. So I, I'd knock it out by noon. I was, food, I was done. Food. Maybe you could click this in with, with agriculture of some kind, too. I, I, agriculture, village. to me, is, is part of the key there. Yeah. Because you're out in nature. You're, we all know we need... Getting um, exercise, fresh air, all and, that. And everybody wants farm to table, but nobody can afford to pay for the, yeah. uh, the, the farm workers at that rate because of the, the, thing, because of the uh, cost of the housing. So if you supplied housing and you gave them a, a decent wage, and at first you might have to subsidize it, but to the people that are good, you, then they get their own place. Right. Then they get freedom. Maybe, maybe what's important is freedom on the weekend. So now instead of being there seven days a week, Okay, you can go on the weekend, you take, catch the shuttle bus, go see your friends over there, but you got to come back on, on Monday. So they get food and they get care, they get, they get services if they live there. If they want to take a walk and abandon their, their tiny house, yeah. uh, you know, then all those things stop. They right. can't come back either. You know, I think it's, a, it's like, like in China, it's a social score. Mm -hmm. If you behave yourself, you get benefits. Sure. If you don't, you don't get benefits. Okay, the, the last question, we only have a minute left mm -hmm. here. So I build my community or your community, so sure. to speak, of 
lots of houses with paths and common areas, with services, with agricultural plots, with compensation for 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 work. And they can build that village. Building right. other houses, you know. Yes. Um, and and I have stages uh, and incentives. You know, if you do well, you know, a better part of the part of the pro property. Uh, if you don't do so well, you're off the property, all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a kind of a lot of rules, but, but at the end of the day, they have a pretty good life, okay? So is what we have just described also appropriate to deal with the affordable housing uh, problem in the state, or are we talking only about uh, homelessness? It's interesting, but our form of construction called panel and post, and I don't think you have the other one, but I, there, we actually, I'm having engineers Make sure, but we can actually build a three and maybe even a four-story walk-up to fit into the Bill 7. Um, uh, so you would mix them up. You would say, we got tiny houses for people who really have no money. Yep. We got uh, medium size, maybe even larger tiny houses for people who have a few bucks or who are working and can afford to pay rent. Would you, would you rent to them? Uh, what's the relationship? Is it a is it a landlord-tenant relationship? Is it, is it a buyer? That's a good question. Yeah. I'm the guy that builds these kits and has the patents on this kit. And I will train your workforce with a couple of my guys here to build that town, to build that city, to, to build whatever you want. We will train them how to do them, maybe with a little government assistance to get up and running. But after a while, they won't really need me to do that. Just buy the kit from me. And whenever you need me to come down there, we'll certify that it was built right, that it's waterproof, that's whatever. But I would like to see... It, you know, I've already made my, my money and my time, 40 years as a roofing contractor. I'm happy to do the building to get these off the project. I team with a general contractor in order to do, a licensed general contractor now to do it. But to me, the real success would be to get the homeless to build it themselves. It's a social, the social effort. In fact, I would venture to say, we'll, we'll have to leave it here, I would venture to say that this project, this, this case study project we've been talking about, really depends in a critical way on somebody setting up the social structure uh, in the village. If you don't have a social structure in the village, and you have to present yeah. this to Kimberly yeah. Pine or anyone else yeah. in the city council the legislature to get funded, to get permits, but if you could present a social structure, it seems to me an easy path to building this kind of village. Um, otherwise, you know, we're going to have trouble getting the money and getting the permission. Anyway. Frank, thank you so much for coming down. My pleasure. For a stimulating and important discussion. It is. Frank, thank Rogers, you so much. Tiny I appreciate homes. it. Yeah, thanks so much. A lot.